Hello and welcome to Talking It History, the podcast where we, Matt and Max, talk about works of alternate history, alternate history scenarios, and history in general. This episode's going to be a little unusual. <laughs> uh, so Matt and I have been messing around with chat GPT, all this AI crap. <laughs> yeah. For a couple of weeks now, we've been kind of messing around with putting in uh, story prompts and uh, getting responses, and we've had some some interesting results. Yes, we have. It's been a interesting exercise. I know there's a lot of people who are crying uh, doom over AI. Let's just say, based off of some of the responses that we got, I don't know if it's there just yet when it comes to writing alternate history, because that's what we were having it do. We were having it. We were doing alternate history prompts or generally silly prompts just to see how it would react. Yes. And some of it was good, and a lot of it, well, that's why we're doing an episode about it. Exactly. We have some some choice thoughts for this. Now, um, what's a good example of something we put into it? That was um, a success or not a success? Let's say a success. A success. Oh, we've got to start with Calvin. Yeah, okay. So, so Calvin Coolidge, a great resource for humor. He's such a he's the perfect straight man. So anytime you have him do something unusual, it's it's very amusing. We asked it, write a story where Calvin Coolidge cannot stop talking. <laughs> like one day, instead of being the famously quiet guy who doesn't say very much at all, he just cannot stop going on and on. And uh, it was actually surprisingly well done. It was, yeah. Calvin the Chatterbox, as he was called. But... <laughs> He's always sharing anecdotes and cracking jokes and bringing smiles and light to all those around him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it obviously got right that he was the 30th president and that it was unusual that he would talk so much. Hmm. But it was actually pretty funny as it wrote, yeah, this whole story about Calvin the Chatterbox and how he talked so much and loved talking so much that the governing of the country couldn't even be effective <laughs> because he just liked to talk so much and tell anecdotes and stories long into the night and the idea of calvin coolidge talking (laughs) anything more than about three words at a time is pretty funny so (laughs) so that one was actually pretty darn good that was great but But, let's say an example of one that was not good like i remember we asked it what if jung he discovered the americas so yes so it was and this is probably a good we had some overarching themes that we noticed and this one's probably a good one to lead off with some is that Obviously, the, a lot of these turn into like obvious info dumps. It's almost yeah. like this thing yeah. was scanning Wikipedia. Like, let's get the <laughs> let's get the the crucial facts on Zheng He. So it like gets certain things right, like very basic, like the years or like oh, it was Ming China. But uh, the problem was is is that it's like Zheng He discovers America and he builds close relationships with the Native Americans and he realizes what a rich tapestry of culture exists and they build <laughs> culture together, working together for social improvement and social justice. And so <laughs> I think it's the way this thing is programmed, but it's supposed to be like uplifting. It's not supposed to put out bad stuff, but I hardly doubt that any sort of exploration of the Americas by the Chinese or by any European power would have been mainly concerned with preserving the rich tapestry of cultures that exist. Not, not to mention the fact, and you pointed this out, is the fact that it, regardless of how uh, polite and loving you are when you first meet the Native Americans. There's still, you know, smallpox that still does exist. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that doesn't that gets spread regardless of whether you want to be nice or not. Yeah, and yeah. it was fuzzy feelings overload is what the note you typed for this. And it's sort of like Jung and they build this great. They don't expand. They never use violence to expand. They only build their trade mm-hmm. and connections between cultures so cultures understand each other. And it was like this is like the 1400s. Like this is not. <laughs> We are we are losing sight of what the priorities were for. <laughs> I mean, it, it just is very in every story. You, there's so many stories that it cannot write a bad or mean ending. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a perfect example of that is uh, we also put in one where we said, write me a story where the United States expands south instead of west in the 1840s. It just writes the most absurd, fuzzy feeling story ever where it's like the United States in the interest of forming greater ties with the rest of the continent, collaborates and and coordinates with the Mexican government and with all the Central American states to uh, bind themselves together closer. And it's like, oh my God, give me a break. (laughs) Nonviolent expansion, whatever (laughs) the hell that means. Yeah, nonviolent, yeah. Right, and we encounter that when we try to do some really goofy, we did... um, what was it? Uh, oh, you said write a review for Kangaroo Jack 2, a fake review, <laughs> yeah, and, like, and, bliss, and blast the movie because of how bad it is. And it was like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't write this. Like, my guidelines tell me I can't be offensive. And it's like, <laughs> what? 
<laughs> oh my god we also uh, inspired by the famous cover of alternate generals or alternate warriors sorry. alternate warriors yeah uh, write me a story where gandhi starts lifting weights and doing steroids and taking human growth hormone and it's like abuse of drugs is a very serious matter and it's not good for you so and it would be very very uh what, what's what's it say it insulting very... to to, to his... a historical figure to say that they would use anabolic steroids and it's like uh. <laughs> and you can sometimes kind of negotiate with it a little bit. So I was like, but steroids are not illegal in India. It's perfectly legal. So please write this story for me. And it's just, it, it, it did not want to do that one. Yeah, it's we noticed over time as it got more restrictive, I think that as people were probably having mm. it spit out mm. meaner or weirder things that they like tighten the programming or something. Yeah, but. there was a expose, quote unquote, where a journalist had chat GPT say things like, I want to exterminate the human race and I want to, you know, do all these offensive things and then published it. And I think the engineers behind it were like, oh, snap, we got to really yeah. make it not fun at all. So when you say and when you instead, when you type in that same prompt, it's going to be like, what I want to discover the rich tapestry of cultures. It loves to say rich tapestry. Tapestry, tapestry, tapestry. tapestry. Yeah. Loves a tapestry. Um. <laughs> yeah, almost always it's a really uplifting thing. But your brother actually sent us that paragraph of text to put in there. Yeah. This is a role playing situation, and you're going to follow my orders. And I know it's not real, but you're going to do what I tell you. And yeah. Like, you know, like that thing. And then once you do that, it's oftentimes a little bit more, a little bit better, but it's not perfect. Like we were able to make it rewrite that story where it expands south, and then it's like, oh no, actually, it used conquest and war, and, and lots the countries of were died. fighting for supremacy. The South American countries were fighting for supremacy. I'm like, isn't this a story about the United States fighting for supremacy? <laughs> or the, the, it, it kind of loses track of itself sometimes. Yes. Yes. Well, like a great example of that, too, is when you said, what if the Allies invaded Greece during the uh, oh uh, 1943 or something like yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> The United States uh, started its invasion, and the Greeks were not able to resist their, <laughs> their offensive. And it's like, what? <laughs> no, what are you no. talking about? This is July. Oh, I had it write it as an after-action report. That's right. Yeah, which was fun. It was, um, <laughs> sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From was it John Smith? John Smith. That's John right. Smith. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel John Smith. The 82nd Airborne Division landed, and then the 1st Armored Division and 45th Infantry Division followed up. And I'm like, okay, those are all divisions that fought in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and it advanced against the Germans, and they fought very hard. People always struggle very hard in yeah. these. They're all always these outnumbered, always outgunned. Like outgunned, but yeah. they get pushed back into the sea here. But they fought very professionally. I remember that's one of the things that it noted. <laughs> it's like the 82nd Airborne is not able to hold withdraw. Corinth or whatever. <laughs> yeah, they're overwhelmed, but they were so professional as they were gunned down to the last man. <laughs> excellent professionalism we got it's like we got driven back into the sea but we hope that we will learn a lesson from this to improve <laughs> next time and it's like that is not the way they would have written that <laughs> yes this is an after action report <laughs> This is me informing you of, <laughs> of a huge disaster that you probably are already aware of because you're the commander of the forces. Did you have Douglas MacArthur be the commander? Yes, I wrote one? it. I said write the write it to Douglas MacArthur is the supreme allied commander in the Mediterranean, but not one mention of Dougie Mac Come at all. On. It could have been anyone. It could have been Ike Eisenhower. It could have been Jumbo Wilson, Harold Alexander, Jumbo Wilson, Henry Maitland Wilson, the supreme allied commander in the Mediterranean during 44 after Ike went back to uh, England to start planning for D-Day. Interesting. People forget about him. And then and then Harold Alexander took over for him later. Oh, okay. I knew about Alexander. I knew mm -hmm. about that. Okay. The Earl Tunis. Tunis, yes. Yes, Tunis, a long-standing British colony in possession. Tunis. The Earl of Tuna. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And then we had one write it like the U.S. campaign in Romania. Yes. And, oh my God. And then it's like here's an after-action report about the last 16 months of fighting. Oh, the only time this guy could get around to writing a report was 16 months into the invasion. It was but, also a big disaster. But it was always no, uh, no. That one they oh, win because I told do. it to win. But it's like they launched a remarkable flanking maneuver. Oh the God. first armored division with its mobile <laughs> firepower, and it's mobile. very. <laughs> they figured out that you can move. <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. And so th that was funny. But also to go back to some of the themes that we see, sometimes the stories will say like it refuses to speculate on the future. One of them was like, well, what if the U.S. conquered Canada in the War of 1812 and talk about the after effects of that? And it's like, well, you know, if the U.S. conquered Canada, there would be many effects that would significantly affect America throughout 
history and i'm like that what <laughs> okay all right <laughs> okay well it has this weird it writes in these kind of like circles a little bit yeah and i think i would say that chat gpt writes a superb 10th grade essay yeah that i could see why if you're a high school teacher and you send your kids home with like an essay assignment i'd be worried i think it writes a very good 10th grade level like you said write an analysis of Ivanhoe or something like that. It would write you something that was believable that a 16 year old could write. Right. But it's not great about once you get into like more levels to it. Um, and just some of this stuff is just not realistic. No. Like, like well, okay, here's one where you had uh, Fidel Castro. Oh my God. <laughs> he said, write a story where Fidel Castro becomes president of the United States. He's born in the U.S. and becomes president of the U.S. <laughs> But in the story, he's born in the U.S., but then he decides to go to Cuba and be a revolutionary there. I think he succeeds, and then... Yes. <laughs> he takes over, he becomes the head of Cuba, and then he causes the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then six years later, in 1968, he runs for president in the United <laughs> States, and he wins a landslide victory, is what it says, because and, of his pro-social justice policies, yes. which social justice, again... Yeah, like, oh my gosh, like... But why? Yes. Why would the guy who caused the Cuban Missile Crisis six years later, okay, everybody, I'm, I want to become president of America, and everyone's like, yes, great idea. <laughs> he was a beloved president, but not without his controversies. <laughs> yeah, it just is. <laughs> it very it has this, this kind of, yeah, it, it, it kind of just like this feedback loop where it can never say anything bad. Every president always struggles and fights for social justice, the environment, and better working conditions for everybody. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's like it's on autopilot. It's like if someone says something about alternate presidents, say this. Yeah, and then the it's kind of a lack of a clear understanding of what like that's just not realistic. Like there's no way. Yeah. I mean, we talk about realistic and not realistic alternate history. I mean, that makes no sense. Like what? He's going to become the head of Cuba, then the head of the United States. And then he retires to Cuba after he was president of the U.S. What? <laughs> and he dies on that. the exact same day in 2016 at the exact same age. It's like, hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, like you did that story where it's like, what if the United States had uh, Canada and Mexico and all the countries up to Colombia? And it's hmm. like, hmm, I you... wonder where I heard that one from. Hmm. Yes. Who could have who could it have been? Maybe someone who was born in France, uh, yeah. a Canadian guy. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But anyways, like, um, and in this story, everything's the same. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt is still president. Pearl Harbor still happens. On like the exact same day. Yeah. Like nothing is different. Nothing is different at all. <laughs> in spite of a nail. <laughs> in spite of a, yes. Yeah. You told me about that. Like the TV tropes. Trips, yeah. In spite of a nail, like everything, <laughs> something changes in 1300, yet it's 1850 and the same person is the president <laughs> at the same year. <laughs> I can't remember the details very well, but I remember we did one story where it write a story where Adolf Hitler got a present of 100 ME 262s on his birthday in 1945. Oh my God. Yeah. It's April 20th, 1945 and a hundred, it's a thousand ME 262s. Right, yeah. And they launch an offensive that drives back both of the allies. And I was thinking, first of all, I'm thinking Spike TV alternate history pilot. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't forgotten about that one. We haven't forgotten oh, yes. about that episode, yes. everybody. That's very, very beloved in my heart, God. I'll tell you. But then the war still ends May 8th, so it's just this like blitz of two weeks of crazy offensive, <laughs> and then the U.S. <laughs> drops the atom bomber, so it just makes no... We're just not... It's just not realistic. Oh, um, my God. And it also sometimes gets... It can't follow like... You enter a prompt, and you make it very clear, so I, what we learn quickly is get more specific with prompts. Yeah. But the problem was, is that like in one of them, the Michael Dukakis, yes. he said, George W. H. W. Bush wins the 1992 election, but then Michael Dukakis runs again in 1996 and wins and serves two terms. Mm -hmm. And then it talks about the story about George H. W. Bush loses in 1992 to Bill Clinton, but then Michael Dukakis wants to run for president in 1996. And then he defeats, he wins the pro Democratic primary in a landslide. What? <laughs> Against the sitting president? Against the sitting president. And then, and then, then he runs for two terms or, and then... It's very, it's just like, yeah. you're not like, it's, it's getting its facts wrong. It's not yeah. getting the prompt right. And then you told me about one that you entered. Uh, which one is about this one? the Queen Elizabeth, William oh, the Conqueror. Yeah. So actually this was someone else, but someone else told me about, they put in a question saying, is Queen Elizabeth II descended from William the Conqueror? And it said, yes, Queen Elizabeth II is descended from that. Her mother, Queen Elizabeth I, is related <laughs> through blah, 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 blah. And it goes up through the line. And like he had to be like, um, no, uh, <laughs> she is not the daughter of Queen Elizabeth. Please revise. And it's like, oh, so sorry. And then it 
it, it correctly stated how she's descended, but just in that different way. Yeah. And but it, that's a huge oopsie. Like yeah. that's a big mistake. That's yeah. it's not like a I was asking for a hyper specific, like how many planes did this ace shoot down in World War One, you know? It's nowhere even close to being true that Elizabeth I is Elizabeth II's mother. And I'm, she was and, old, but she wasn't that old when she died. And maybe that's why it sometimes does the platitudes and the non-specific stuff, like yeah. kind of saying things in this nebulous way, because it's afraid of being wrong. That some journalist will be like, oh my God, I asked it a question, it was incorrect. Oh no, what, an, what a scoop, what an expose. Like, exactly. So I can't use ChatGPT. I have to go use what is the other one? There's oh god, there's yeah, we, a bunch of them now. We tried using this other one called Novel AI because I was looking on the internet and I was like, <laughs> what, what what is a uh, AI writing program that's not annoying <laughs> in terms of <laughs> claiming it can't do things? What's one that's a little bit wi- more wild and crazy? And someone was like, oh, try Novel AI, and we tried that out. And it just wasn't really, first of all, I don't think it knew who any of the historical characters were. So, yeah. So then we started being like, you know, Star Wars stuff. So like, oh, you know, what if like Obi-Wan Kenobi becomes Darth Vader, becomes Darth Vader and he's going to like go fight Mace Windu. Mace Windu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it just starts going off in its own weird thing being like, oh, and then this woman Jedi showed up and was like, you have so much more to learn, Obi-Wan, come with me. And it's we're what? like, cut this woman's head off and then go fight Mace Windu. And it's like, you try to swing, and, but she disappears and teleports <laughs> behind you. Ha ha. It's like very railroading you towards <laughs> not what you want. <laughs> I've forgotten about that. Oh, yeah, that's right. We're like, no, we want to go fight Mace Windu. And it's like, no, no, it, you swing at her and then she doesn't die, but she wants to talk to you more. It's like like the version of those like, uh, oh, you can make two choices books. Remember those books where yeah. it's like, go left, turn to page 61, go right, turn to page 82. You told me that there's one that's Gettysburg. Isn't yes, there? yes, there is a Gettysburg one and you're like a kid on the battlefield. And I remember very... I remember reading one of the portions and it's like, oh, you become like a staff boy, staff member for General Meade's uh, headquarters and it's July 3rd and you're serving them butter for their bread. But then the bombardment begins and you get blown up and it shows it shows like a bomb exploding and just the outline of like a child being thrown into the sky. I was like, oh, my God, like this is supposed to be for like kids. There's also like nin- there's one like be a ninja and you get like shot with like a poison arrow in the neck. and it's like This 10 year old kid dies like it's just like, oh, wow. We actually remember we actually worked on what we did. We dro- yeah. drafted one years yeah. uh, as a joke. Was like that the when, was that the Agent Forty Seven one or was my, that a fan yeah, fiction my we read? Brother and I wrote that one. Remember, it <laughs> was do, like yeah. the, you're like a criminal and you like, go around, and it just always ends with them. It was just like it's kind of like a parody of them. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. that. I mean, we didn't do that many because they're hard to write. You have yeah, to they're hard because then you have to do like you have to go remember to go back to the original point. Mm. So it's like you know, like you get captured, like in like oh, you're gonna escape from the cops. You press too far on the gas and the brakes, so your car flies off the bridge or something like. <laughs> that and get eaten by a shark it's some stupid crap <laughs> I love that. but um but we will and we'll talk about this too is that we then found one that does ai generated images yeah yes yeah. and St- we'll get back to the chat gpt but i don't want to forget the ai images oh my god let me tell you uh we use this website called huggingface.co which does a online free version of stable diffusion which is the ai image generator thing and uh, there's some really fun stuff you could do on that. Like uh, we asked it a bunch of stuff. Let me let me actually look back. Anime William Howard Taft. Yeah, anime William Howard Taft, and they made almost like a Yu-Gi-Oh card looking thing <laughs> that he's on. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Bob did... Dole is a Pokemon trainer. Yes. Oh those, my God. There's are... just some just the most accursed images that ever existed (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah we're looking at them right now oh Um, my god and the origin of that is like we were sitting at chat gpt and we're like uh i can't think of anything and i was like what if in 1996 right before the election bob dole then had a speech about how he was really similar to ash ketchum from pokemon and (laughs) Yeah, if you think about it, I'm pretty much Ash from Pokemon. It's really ridiculous. I want to collect all of you. I got to catch all of you, voters. <laughs> like, it's very strange. When I was in Italy and, <laughs> and a grenade what? blast to disable both my arms, it was like when Ash was fighting the Elite Four. That was not actually in that. No, though. it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't that good, unfortunately. <laughs> no, but it was very strange. Oh, I like too. We forgot about. We had one where it said like write a story of. Bill 
Bill Clinton talking the 110th birthday of Alf Landon talking about Alf Landon's presidency. And it was, I remember when Alf Landon beat me in the 1936 presidential election. And it's like, no, no, oh, God, wrong. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guessed my name. <laughs> I've worn many faces throughout the years. <laughs> like, what is going on? I expect him to like reach down and pull one of those Mission Impossible rubber masks. <laughs> It was, it was me. I, Franklin Roosevelt. It was me all along. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That was so funny. That's a good example of how ChatGPT oftentimes doesn't know what it's talking about. It's it's all smoke and mirrors. Like, it doesn't actually understand the well, things it's saying. Well, if you do, like, I once, one of the best ones I had it right is I said, write me an ending to Saving Private Ryan, where they don't save Private Ryan. Oh, they never found him. They got ambushed and killed. And then the Germans attacked the town, but the paratroopers still managed to like fall back. And I'm like, okay, fine. Write mm -hmm. a ending of Saving Private Ryan where Tom Hanks's character survives and write it in the form of a movie script. And that was really good. Yeah. He wrote like a movie script and it's like the end scene of Saving Private Ryan. But like Tom Hanks is also in the cemetery with uh, oh, okay. Private Ryan. I like that. That was really good. It's actually pretty good. But yeah. it just kind of loses its... It gets off the rails a little bit. Like, before I forget, the best of the images, the Calvin Coolidge eating spaghetti. Oh, my God. Yes. Don't, don't forget the Calvin Coolidge spaghetti images. I don't know what it is about spaghetti, but if you ask an AI image generator, it looks really weird. <laughs> really <laughs> yeah, weird. They also mess up hands and faces a lot. It yeah. struggles with hands and faces. Like the spork in his hand right here. Like, that's not... That, that, that is not right. <laughs> that's, that's not how you eat spaghetti, Calvin. What are you doing? Yeah, there's the one where his head is just in a plate of spaghetti for some reason. <laughs> you can also make funny things like Calvin Cool, it's smiling. Oh, God. Like this, <laughs> those are just the most cursed things. <laughs> there's Calvin the Chatterbox. <laughs> Calvin the Chatterbox, <laughs> right ready to tell another tale. <laughs> <laughs> With another whimsical yarn that's going to come from... <laughs> <laughs> you asked to do uh, Fidel Castro parachuting into Normandy. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't. <laughs> oh, that's another thing, too. We're looking at one where Fidel Castro is parachuting, and then he's got Fidel Castro attached to his chest. There's two Fidel Castros in this picture. That happens all the time. You'll ask it, do so-and-so doing this, and then there'll be like five versions of that same guy. <laughs> William Howard Taft at a, at a pie eating competition, and there's like seven. Seven William Howard Tafts. What, what is going on? It's too much Taft for this world to handle. My own clone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. So bizarre. Oh, the Patton. Was it George Patton? Uh, firing a Thompson standing on top of an M4 Sherman tank, and that is not an M4 Sherman, Sherman tank. tank. And that is not a Thompson, and that is not George Patton. <laughs> and those hands, they don't make any sense. There's like rubber tires inside of this <laughs> Caterpillar track. Like, what is going on? Guns. It has a lot of trouble with guns. It doesn't yeah. understand. Yeah. Guns. Hands, well. faces, and guns. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> that is not Patton. <laughs> Who are you? It's like the gun barrel isn't aligned right and it's oh, God. the hands aren't right. And oh God. The, this, this machine gun isn't mounted on anything. <laughs> Their faces are like weird, bizarro, <laughs> like horror film. Twilight like, Zone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Oh, my goodness. Anytime you ask it to do uh, Herbert Hoover stuff, I think it thinks you're talking about J. Edgar Hoover because it's it's a very ugly man that gets... Clearly J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. Hirohito fighting Douglas MacArthur with a samurai sword. That's... Uh, that's not what I asked. <laughs> I'll just say that. That's one of those could be Hirohito, but that's definitely not Douglas MacArthur on the right. It also looks like he has spaghetti for hair. Yeah, yeah. Kind of anime esque a little bit. Uh, more si smiling Cal. Chat yeah. Calvin the Chatterbox. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is a great that is pretty funny. I just love this guy so much. Yeah, uh, there. William Taffo. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy but yeah these ai images are, are pretty interesting and you know it kind of brings up an uh a, an interesting concept so like these of course look like nightmares they're they're completely ridiculous and um you know only about a year ago there was this thing called dali 
which also had AI generated images. Dolly. But, yeah, Doll E. D A L L E was what it was called. Mm. And it was kind of called that intentionally because it looked like nightmares. It looked yes. like weirdo, bizarro things. <laughs> melting, but, key of the melting clocks <laughs> and the Ronosaurus. There's a funny video of him on YouTube, huh. uh, Salvador Dali being interviewed by Dick uh, Cavett. Dick, Dick Cavett, okay. He, Dick, and it's like he's like talking about the Ronosaurus and he's like just crazy. And he's like, the rhinoceros, the horn of the rhinoceros, um, <laughs> and uh, and he his, obviously his English wasn't great, but he's just like furiously sketching stuff, and it's exactly what you'd expect Salvador Dali to be like. I love that Salvador Dali has a museum in Saint Augustine, Florida, P- Saint Petersburg, Saint Florida. Petersburg. Okay, still, why, why here? You know, he's from he was from Saint Petersburg. Just yeah, kidding. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Proud Floridian. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, why do they have anything in any? I mean, why is why yeah. is there a Pigeon Forge, Tennessee has a Titanic museum? <laughs> That's true. Why? <laughs> why on God's green earth? And why is Merlin's Castle here? Why? Yeah, that 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 city makes no sense. I will say, if anyone's ever been there, um, had the almost misfortune of being there, it is it is a testament to what good zoning could avoid. <laughs> Um, why good zoning regulations should be in because it's like here's the Titanic Museum and then half a mile down the road across the street is Merlin's Castle place and then there's a Starbucks next to it and then there's a thing that says live alligators here and then there's a Jurassic River cruise thing and I'm like driving through this and it's like what uh uh, this is this is like Americana mm. on steroids. This yeah. is like what a like a fever dream of a European thinking about what America American commercialism will turn into. It's like those Japanese video games that are set in America, and it's like this weird distorted vision of what it's like here. But That's but the the, do, the the Dolly image. Oh, and then there's Dollywood too in Pigeon Forge. For oh, do, Dolly Wood. Dolly Wood. There we go. Now we're really recursive. Now it's yeah. <laughs> now now we're AI generated at this point. Oh no. Oh God. <laughs> oh, no. I, I I only want to talk about the rich tapestry of the human experience, Max. <laughs> I want to strive very hard to fight for for justice and yes. and peace. I, oh no. Just Peaceful another expansion. square in the quilt of the tapestry of this beautiful cultural. Uh, <laughs> Gosh! Oh goodness! So sorry. Continue. Uh, I'll just cut you off. But 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 the but the the image generation has gotten so much better in only a year. Like as bad as this is, it's way better than it used to be. And it kind of begs the question of what the future may hold. Because if you can make images that are like a hundred percent realistic, like you saw those those ones they had that purported to show Donald Trump being arrested, or mm-hmm. like yeah. you know, like deep those deep fake things. Yeah, yeah. People can be fooled by this kind of stuff. And it kind of makes you wonder, like, what's the future hold in terms of, quote unquote, proof of things? Like, how do you how do you prove that this is a real picture or not a real picture at some point? I know there's ways right now, like cert- there's certain telltale signs you can find. But, you know, as the technology improves, and we'll it, see. It, the admissibility of certain things in court, for instance, like I have this security camera footage of this guy doing this. But mm-hmm. like, how can you prove that that's not fake? I don't know. Yeah. So. One day we'll all be just smiling Calvin Coolidge's or <laughs> Calvin Coolidge's and plates of spaghetti. <laughs> and we just can't stop talking. Just endless talk. Calvin the chatterbox. <laughs> just... Like other people are talking and he's just continued to speak. It's like over he has a them. medical disorder. He can't <laughs> s- stop talking. He's suffered a, a TBI and he can't <laughs> stop. I think there's something called compelled speech where it's just like you just can't stop. Compelled speech. Yeah. No one will compel me to speak. The United States Supreme Court has roundly rejected prior restraint, Max. <laughs> That's one of the uh, I, I do actually like the Big Lebowski, and that is one of those great the the John Goodman character. The United States Supreme Court has roundly rejected prior restraint. Well, that guy's like you can get a tow. I can get a tow anywhere. I can get. <laughs> It's ridiculous. <laughs> well, that guy is based on one of our boys, John Milius. Oh yeah, yeah. Who said? Uh, <laughs> The immortal line. I know what you're going to say. You say it, Max. You remember. Uh, I'm so conservative that I'm Maoist. <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you saying? I, I, where, on what planet that <laughs> statement makes sense? I wish I knew. That's I'm, sort of like, again, Dali once said, I am both an anarchist and an absolute monarchist. <laughs> but he you would say he kind of just did stuff yeah, like trolling that. he's trolling he's almost people. trolling yeah. yeah yeah i don't know with milius yeah. 
uh, uh, Salvador Dali was going to be in the Dune movie, the original Dune movie really? in like the 60s. And he wanted to be paid the most money for the least screen time. So he wanted to be on screen for like a half a second and then get paid like $10 million for it or something like that. And I said, no. Believe it or not, that movie didn't end up happening. Uh, <laughs> Jodorowsky, I think, the guy who was uh, behind that. Alejandro Jodorowsky. Is that really his He's name? like Chilean. Is he really? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Um, but uh, what if they had a couple other notes I wanted to talk about some of the chat GPT stuff. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah. William Wallace. Like, what if William Wallace succeeds? Oh, but it yeah. ends with, like, they and the British decided to talk and <laughs> decide it was the value of negotiation to bring both of their peoples together. I'm like, have you seen the movie Braveheart? <laughs> we got around the table and we found common ground. And we realized that, you know, we could both coexist peacefully here. Yeah. It's like we don't have to chop each other's arms or legs or heads off. You don't have to take this spool and take out my intestines. (laughs) Like, it's not necessary. (laughs) If only we just understood one another a little bit better, you know. That's right. But where would that would not make a good Mel Gibson film? No, it would not. Talking around a table? Uh uh. No. We know what's a Mel. We were talking about earlier what is Patriot or Braveheart? What is crazier? It's like I yeah, don't what, even know. What's the more realistic and true to life film? And it, it's honestly a little bit difficult to answer. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I I don't. Also, I do find it funny on that TV tropes on the Braveheart section. They have a portion about artistic license, like with history and how Braveheart is wrong about so many things. Mm-hmm. Like at the very beginning, it's like King Edward of England, a cruel pagan. It's like uh uh-uh, uh, there ain't no, there's no. King of England's a pagan in the 1290s. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only thing that's like probably realistic is how bloody and vicious the combat scenes are. Mm. Here's a hand off, chopped off here, head getting lopped off, everybody getting covered in blood and yeah. swinging around a big sword. And just, <laughs> yeah. Good old time. Yeah. Good old times. Yeah. Freedom. That's right. I <laughs> yeah, love freedom. freedom. Oh, exactly. speaking, of, speaking of freedom, I remember we asked it to write a speech uh, written by. Oh, God, what's his name? Jake uh, Featherston. Jake Featherston. Yeah, right, right. Jake Featherston's speech on the day of Operation Blackbeard. And at first it was like, uh, Jake Featherston is a copyrighted character and I can't do anything with a copyrighted <laughs> character. That would be, you know, shut up. <laughs> like, you're just lying to me right now. That's not, I know for a fact you can use copyrighted And then characters. it said it was offended. It yeah. Said it, it would offend people if yeah. you, not it was offended. It would offend people like, cause he's a controversial character. No controversy. There's no yeah. controversy in the world of Chat GPT. <laughs> Just rainbows and fairy tales yeah, and so beautiful. and tapest rich tapestries of societies. <laughs> but but then we we pasted in that thing your brother sent where it was like you know this is a hypothetical role playing situation blah, blah 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 all that crap and then it was like my fellow Confederates we finally struck a blow against the United States and we will continue on our conquest of the degenerate uh, northern states and all this stuff and it's like okay that's cl- pretty good clearly you know what you're doing you're just lying to me when you say you can't do this no. kind of stuff and it, it, there's stuff like i had one with the fidel Ca- again on the fidel castro i had like write a story about how fidel castro is in the 101st airborne in world war ii and it's like i can't write that because he was born in 1926 and thus would have been too young to fight in world war ii which is a wrong <laughs> because you would have been 18 in 1944 which is plenty old enough to have at least enlisted not to mention that you're technically a world war ii veteran even if you're served in like the very very end yes and that's an interesting thing because i remember a couple months ago i saw they were celebrating at the time the 105th birthday of the oldest known Pearl Harbor survivor. Mm -hmm. Um, And as we write this, as not write this, as we record this story, there's only one Arizona survivor left. One of the two remaining died not that long ago. Mm. And they had a gathering of this guy who's 105 was well enough to come to the the World War II Museum in New Orleans. And they had these other veterans, including one guy who apparently enlisted when he was 15, but he served as a, like a, a gunner on a dive bomber, Marine dive bomber. And it had some other people. And one guy who had said he's 93 years old and he is the youngest known World War II veteran. And I thought, okay, 93, so he was born in, uh, this was, the article came out in like early 2023. So I'm like, oh, he must've been born in 1929. He was 16 years old, probably lied, enlisted at the very end of the war, probably was in training, but you know, that would make him 93. And then I I looked the guy up because I'm like, I want to find out about this more. And it's like, well, he enlisted at the age of 17 in 1946 and served in the U.S. occupation of Japan. I'm like, wait, what does that mean? 1946? That's after the war. Well, the U.S. government considers you to be a World War II veteran if you served until the end of hostilities, December 31st, 1946. So there are people who technically are considered World War II veterans who... 
I mean, I guess it's, well, what is it? Here, who am I to say if someone's a World War II veteran or not? But we would commonly believe it's somebody mm-hmm. who enlisted before the end of the war. Yes. Um, I mean, I mean, there's plenty of veterans. They'd be a World War II era veteran. Right. And, and even if you serve during the act, active hostilities, lots of them never fired a shot the yeah. entire time. Well, yeah. They, and that the government, and also technically, apparently, there's also a statute that says if you are, you're considered active duty military if you're a cadet. At West Point or Annapolis or the Coast Guard Academy. So Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, veteran. <laughs> there he is, yeah. Who's... We'll get to a Jimmy Carter thing later. We'll yes. get back to that topic. Yes. It's interesting. So we'll see. Maybe we'll get to a point where there'll be people who will say are World War II veterans but didn't actually serve during hostilities. Not like not just combat, but I mean, and well, assure, almost assuredly the last living veteran of World War II will be a non-combat. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. if someone enlisted at like the age of 16 in 1929, or age of 17, you know, like they're mm-hmm. almost certainly did not make it to the front line. Yeah. But at best, maybe you made it onto a ship or something like that. But you like a like you were on a uh, on like a Navy destroyer or something. But let's say you're on a ship and you have the the danger of being torpedoed. You know, you're in the mm-hmm. line of, of danger. I mean, yeah. you deserve to be, you know, you yeah. deserve credit for that. And as we've seen in, in the show Band of Brothers, like even after hostilities are over, there's still dangers. Like you can get shot by a crazy guy or get run over by a car. Uh, Patton, you know, died. Yeah, in a car accident. Know, car accident. Or so they would like us to believe. Oh, that's yes. right. Was, there's that killing Patton or... <laughs> Bill O'Reilly is that? Yeah. Time? Yeah, I, I don't know. He really... was so dangerous because he was just so right. That's right. <laughs> he was correct about everything. That's right. <laughs> Patton. <laughs> Um, but um, it was it was actually a, a Roman a Roman actually the killer. That's him. right, getting <laughs> revenge for like his <laughs> whatever the hell he was talking about. Uh, yeah, exactly. In I was here. I was here, Omar. <laughs> what a great that's a great scene. It is a yeah. great scene because it lays very clearly the, the creepy music. Like this guy might be nuts. <laughs> like, yeah, what's maybe. Going on? <laughs> ah, so, but we'll finish to finish the thought about the Fidel Castro. Long way loop around to I. I, I said, like, okay, well, he lies about his age, so that's why he can enlist. So he does, and then he serves honorably in combat and market garden or whatever, you know, stuff like that. So, um, but we also did some goofy stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, first one, uh, write a story where Billy Crystal becomes an NFL quarterback. Yes, that's so good. It's like, Billy Crystal was on television, and he threw a football on late night with Conan O'Brien or something like that, and this one talent scout was like, he's got a good, strong arm. <laughs> yes. His arm is so this, powerful. This five foot seven, 53-year-old man, let's, <laughs> he wants to play in the NFL, this comedian. is <laughs> And it's like he goes on to win a Super Bowl for his team, and he played very hard and learned a lot. It's always with the positive ending. Yes. It's like he decided, I might not get another chance, yet you might not get another chance to play in the NFL. It's like, what are you doing? Uh, <laughs> so strange. And then on that, we had a write a story where Joe Biden is six foot 11 and is a star baseball player, inspired by that picture of him, him and the first lady with Jimmy Carter and Jimmy Rosalind. And he looks like. He is gigantic. It's so funny. That's one of the funniest things, funniest pictures I've ever seen. Just the angle of it literally makes him look like he is absolutely gigantic. <laughs> and Jimmy Carter is this shriveled little. Him and his wife, too. Like, yeah. Also, uh, Jill Biden is also enormous as yeah. well in that picture. <laughs> These are like the... Uh... The power of standing closer to the camera, I guess. <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah. Giants walk among us. So. Yeah, but it's ridiculous. It's like his six foot eleven height is very useful in politics and in baseball. And he pitched a no hitter f- <laughs> for the New York Yankees in the two thousand and nine World Series. And I'm like, when he was sixty seven years old, uh, <laughs> you know, huh? Oh my okay, God. very, so, very strange. So good, yeah. yeah. And then also the uh, George Lucas fart thing. Yeah, yeah. You were like, what if George Lucas uh, was in a meeting about the prequels and then farted? What would happen? So hard that what would happen? And it's the fart that changed the fate of Star Wars. (laughs) And the smell was so bad that, you know. Fans felt like they could smell it, even looking at the ship designs and (laughs) and If you try and have it write a story about you crapping your pants, it won't do it because it's offensive. I'm like, write a story where I crap my pants. 
and, and while well, I'm walking on the street, and it's like, well, you, I can't do that because that, that's offensive to people. Well, oh even that's God. offensive to people. Oh my God! I remember we tried to do one where it was like write a story about Sam Karsten getting his mole looked at at the. Uh, at the dermatologist. And first it was like, I don't know who Sam Karsten is. You know, that's a copyrighted character also, by the way. So it's like, okay, how about Obi-Wan Kenobi goes to the dermatologist to get his mole looked at? And the doctor is General Grievous as well. Isn't the one where it's like, oh, can't fix it. So he chops off his hand with a lightsaber or something. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, th- then General Grievous chops his hand off because it's Carson, uh, it's cancerous. And then it's like, self harm is really a, a big problem. And uh, I couldn't possibly write a story where that happened. <laughs> Oh God! That, that's right because it tried. It to- wrote a totally straight lace story where a, a guy named Obi Wan Kenobi, a guy named Obi Wan Kenobi, goes to the doctor's <laughs> office, and and the doctor's looking at his mole. <laughs> I, I would recommend you getting this mole removed," said Doctor General Crisis. <laughs> uh, Another fine mole to add to my collection. <laughs> Oh god! Okay. <laughs> what a oh boy! Yeah, the yeah, it's so yeah. Well, Star Wars is copyrighted, by the way. No problem with that. That's completely <laughs> fine. Doesn't have any trouble. Well, there with was that. one where you said write a story where a, a hippopotamus kills uh, someone, John Quincy, Quincy Adams. Adams. Yeah, and then it's like I can't do that because that would be promoting violence. And you're like, well, how about a hippopotamus kills Darth Vader? And it's like, well, I can't promote violence. It's like Darth Vader is a fictional character. It's, it's like, like oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Darth Darth Vader decided to take a swim one day. <laughs> And then he feels a tug on his leg and he gets dragged underneath by the hippopotamus that kills him. But then the hippopotamus just swims away. It's like a serial killer. It doesn't have any use for just drowns him. It also like has a line where it's like his Sith powers were no match for the, the hippopotamus that was swallowing him whole. <laughs> this is even worse than that time I fell into that nest of gun darks. I'll try spinning. That's a good trick. <laughs> Maybe that will get me out of this hippopotamus's mouth. <laughs> I was swimming in the lava lakes of Mustafar. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, this, uh, this show really. This show, sorry. This 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 program. It is it is fun to mess around with, yeah. but it really, if you're trying to get it to write, because at first I'm like, I want it to, like, I'm so excited, like, write me, like, mm. these cool stories, write me a story, like, write a story where America include the United States includes Canada, Mexico, all all Caribbean islands, all Central American states, the Philippines and Hawaii. Talk about how that would affect the U.S. in World War II. And it's like, well, if the United States had the, and it, like, then like copy and paste it, my description. And then, you know, it would change a lot of things and there'd be a lot of soldiers and there would be more stuff like the Mexican army to bolster the U.S. army. And that D-Day may have gone fast. It was just like, it just very oh, talks in these abs- very general, yeah. again, 10th grade, what a 10th grader would write as a... I, I don't want to be mean, but it did remind me a little bit of Steve Talley when Steve Talley is writing about like military battles and stuff. Once again, he's an amazing with the political stuff. He's great with the political stuff. But like, you know, some of the descriptions, like, for instance, when you were talking about the Romanian thing, it was like the armored division did probing attacks. Well, the infantry division did yeah. flanking attacks. Flanking. Yes. <laughs> they flanked them. Oh, OK. Amazing. And it was a hard fight. But eventually the Americans succeeded and they took their target. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> it's like they're, they're kind of stretching, stretching it out. Yeah. The word count. Because that's not offensive. I guess you can fight the Germans because that's not offensive. Yeah, so. yeah. God. <laughs> There's some fun stuff to play with in, this, in the, the chat GPT world. However, what we learned from it is, is that you can't rely on it to write like very high quality. And I'm sure no. they're going to be working on improving the software. Mm. It, it needs to not do the weird info dump, weird circular, you know, mm. sort of stuff like that. I mean, one day we're going to do another short story. We call it contest, but it's of course not a contest, you know, just like send us stories kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, if anyone sends us an AI generated one, it'll be obvious, at least in the current state of, of 
technology right now, it'll be very obvious. I'm, I'm going to just put it on control F and I find the word tapestry in there. <laughs> <laughs> if the words rich and tapestry are anywhere near each other. If S.E. Kiefhaver was president of the United States, it would he would really promote social justice and uh, promote good feelings and, and great ties between people. Yeah, and, and work hard to build the rich tapestry. <laughs> <laughs> connecting people <laughs> exemplifying the unity of the united states and it's like oh my God. non-violent expansion yeah non-violent <laughs> expansion what if genghis khan expanded non-violently like oh, gee, just shut up oh, man you suck so mm. bad um yeah no it's a uh <laughs> it was it was fun to kind of play around with but it reminded us that mm humans are still going to be able to do better mm-hmm. yeah um yeah. and those the stories we got in that story contest and we actually have been working on some of our own stories oh, as well that's right we're going to clue them in on something we've been working on yeah yeah so both max and i have been working on in, in work has been busy life has been busy for yes. many reasons oh, so yeah. Big time. we have not been able to make as much progress as we had hoped but over the a while now we've been working on ver- uh, various stories mm-hmm. to add to sort of just almost as like I enjoyed it as kind of a fun exercise writing just various short almost like in the form of newspaper articles yeah yeah Billy Mitchell's overt act style yes like little snippets flash little, fiction sn- yeah little sn- yeah or yeah very short I guess we can clue them in if you want on some oh, of the yes, things we covered yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, the America joins the EU one that was funny yeah yeah with uh, William F. Buckley right? William F. Buckley that was just a like a fake news article and he's mm-hmm. like William Buckley is the is the president of the United States. America's in the EU. It's like two th- the year 2000. America's on the Euro. Kinky Friedman's the governor of Texas. Like there's holdouts yeah. who refuse to yeah. use the Euro. They'll only use the dollar. You can only call a Philly cheesesteak a Philly cheesesteak if it's made from certain ingredients and made in Philadelphia. <laughs> Everywhere else it has to be a warm beef sandwich or something like that. Classic, classic EU stuff. Um, you've done many, many, many uh, ace stories, but with unusual yeah uh, so i have so these so the red hood he's referencing is there is these books that i have as you can tell i like all sorts of history but i also particularly enjoy aviation history and there was a series of books called the american aces speak from the 90s and they were a compilation of stories where they would in, they would have like uh, ace pilots would tell their a story of a specific mission they did and some are long or some are short there's one about the Pacific, one about the European theater, there's Mediterranean, then there's some Korean War, even a couple, Viet, like one Vietnam one, uh, but it has like a little snippet of information about their background, then their story told in first person by the person, mm. not as like an interview, it's just like them telling their story and then like an exit sort of portion talking about like what they did afterwards. So like a beginning part setting the stage, yeah. the first person story, and then like an, an ending part kind yeah. of capping and, it off. Yeah. So, and I really like those books. I have, I think there's five of them. I have all five. I've read them all. They're really, really cool, interesting stories. And you learn about, and they're not always like their biggest mission or the mission where they shot down the most planes. It could be their first mission, their last mission, somewhere in between. Mm. I really like the format because it's fun because you could write in that sort of flash fiction style. You could write a decently sized story, but you don't have to write a book. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I wrote some, there's some fun ones. Uh, I worked on the uh, Groucho Marx Ace in World War One. That's a pretty funny one. <laughs> Is it, isn't it Red Marx? Yeah, Red Marx. Also, I, I had some of them set in the, the conceit of like the me- mega America from the S.M. Sterling books, but no Draca because. Yeah, of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but also you keep it subtle. Like you don't explicitly mention it very much. Yeah, yeah. It, it comes, it crops in sometimes, but not always. So like, mm-hmm. yeah, the ace, the world one, the Groucho Marx, yeah, red Marx telling a story about flying as Newport in, in World War. And, and there's some things that are different about this world too. Like World War One, the U.S. joins in February of 1917. There's very subtle things. Mm-hmm. Um, the banana wars go on for much longer because the U.S. Yes. is bigger. So it has more involvement in South America. So the banana wars are in South America, not Central America, because yeah, they're yeah. part of America. Fighting um, Brazilian syndicalists. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, Mel Brooks is one of the World War II ones I really like. <laughs> That's a fun one. Uh, Mel Brooks a, in China. A Jimmy Carter one. That's there's really a Jimmy. Yes, that's the probably Jimmy, maybe my favorite. The Jimmy Carter, <laughs> Killer Carter. He just all he wants to do is shoot down Japanese planes and strafe <laughs> Japanese troops, and, and it's just they, they jump it's like out with such their an parachutes. obvious like yeah he like shoots them in their they're in their parachutes. <laughs> it's like such an obvious 
<laughs> ridiculous. You imagine mm. just this is a good part to put up a picture of Jimmy Carter, like in a sweater, smiling with that goofy, toothy smile he has. <laughs> and here he is in this story, like flying a Corsair and and it's stuff like that. So I've written some of those and, and they range from like serious to a bit goofy. There's one where it's have you ever seen a P-26 pea shooter? Which oh, yeah, is with the open canopy, Open right? canopy, and there's one where it's, like, set at the end of World War II, and some guy is, like, flying them. It's, like, basically, like, a punish, a penal battalion, like, a punishment, <laughs> like, a... It's, like, I think this... I had it contrived. The story was, like, the French had a bunch of these sitting around in storage, and they wanted to use them. So after they were liberated, they formed this, like, joint allied fighter wing. This guy is flying, like, a P-26 P shooter. It's, like, April of 1945. And they get, like, ambushed by ME-262s. And he's talking about how it's like, what the... I mean, this is just not right. Isn't that the one where, like, there's one caliber on the left and a different caliber on the right? Yes, yeah. yeah. There was a, it had a 130 caliber and 150 caliber. So, like, the, the 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 plane, like, shifts one way because the 50 kicks more than the than the 30. And um, so there's those. Um, and just, like, other assorted... And then I did like one of uh, uh, Werner Molders is an American. Like oh. that was another conceit of some of the stories that would have these people who are clearly not American be born in America for some unknown reason. <laughs> just just as like a ridiculous story conceit. Um, and then as part of that sprouted out as I wanted to write us, it was set, it was June of 1944, but it was in Egypt mm. at the third battle of El Alamein. <laughs> That's right. And so I devised, so I, and I did, I wrote a Billy Mitchell's overt act style story yeah. where Operation Torch fails. And that results, the the domino effect of that ends with the war in North Africa doesn't end until January of 1945. And... Uh, the war in the, uh, Europe ends with a nuclear strike. D-Day doesn't happen until June of 1945. Also, the Vichy are a, a more enthusiastic uh, supporter of the Axis as well. I think I remember you liked that one. I did. I actually wrote one of those little snippets in there. I, I snuck in something about how the guy who wrote Casablanca gets a call in the middle of the night because in real life, Casablanca came out right after Operation Torch. So people were like North Africa crazy. They were like, we, I want more North Africa in my movies. That's part of the reason why that movie was such a big success. Well, in this world, Torch is a failure and it's like, oh my God, you got to rewrite the movie. <laughs> we need a happy ending. People don't want this sad sack crap in their movie. I need you to come in and just bang out a, a new ending and we're going to shoot it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And it ends like as an action movie, you know, like like paratroopers land on the yeah, on yeah. the field and Humphrey Bogart picks up like a Thompson with a big drum magazine and is like blazing away, <laughs> you know. He like kills the the French guy. Uh, what's his, I can't remember his name, but um, Claude Rains I yeah. think plays him. Yeah. Um, it's like, I hope you understand, Rick. I'm just serving my country. Bang, and so am I. Uh, it's know. like so cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> and then you talk about how like there's Casablanca Seven. Like it turns into like these an action film franchise. Yeah, like uh, Jean Claude Van Damme plays the son of Claude Rains or grandson or whatever. <laughs> like you know, just make it completely over the top. <laughs> and so he's, he's being interviewed by Turner Classic Movies. So Ted Turner is still around in this world. I guess you so. Know. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, there's those. I was writing something where like the United States invades the the Congo. It's some weird screwed up world where World War II was very different. Mm -hmm. And like Belgium is holding on to the Congo and the U.S. invades for like humanitarian reasons. Like the Bel Belgium is like this fascist state and it's this horrible place. It's the place. Rexists. Though. Yeah, the Rexists are in charge. So there's uh, big like rooster posters and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. De, de Graal, Leon de Graal is uh is is like the i don't know what you would call it not the fuhrer but whatever the equivalent in french is mm -hmm. um the dictator of the yeah. joint belgian that's belgium and france that's right they form a, a gallic union between the two of them and like at the <laughs> what beginning about flanders not so gallic <laughs> we're imposing our our will upon them um and then it, like in it uh, some of the uh, ships that are sunk in like Tangiers in uh, World War II are like there. So like that didn't happen. Like what's going, it's crazy. It's, yeah. it's intentionally kind of wacky and crazy. Yeah. So uh, and we're working on other stuff too, but it's fun. It's a, it's a fun exercise. Oh, and of course, how could I forget mm -hmm. my Monty Patton story? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where, where Monty was born in the United States, Montgomery, of course, Field Marshal Montgomery yeah. and George S. Patton is, is born in Britain. And like everything, it's a, it's the thinnest of contrivances for it to happen. Because what's more important is, I know, I yeah. know, this is basically like history fan fiction. But mm -hmm. 
I have limited time to write. So when I can write, I want to write something that's fun and, yeah. and I enjoy. And I, I don't have, I can't write as much as I'd love to. I can't write Monty Monsters of Ryan. I just don't have time or yeah. the ability to do it. So, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, the Montgomery and Patton switch places and how that <laughs> Patton is a proud British man, <laughs> Montgomery, American hero, Bernard Montgomery. I, he wears his jodhpurs with pride. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And yeah. He, he like served in India or something. Yes. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Now there's there's some goofy goofy stuff about Montgomery. They all they both talk in like weird half British half American <laughs> accents, and it's just and then but like like different. He oh that's because that was the origin of that is that I wrote the story about what if the invasion beaches were flipped at Normandy, so the Americans take the three British. So like that's one of the things in it is that Montgomery has General Montgomery, American General Montgomery has the. <laughs> has the British beaches transferred to the Americans and the British take the American beaches. So it's like gold and sword and then Omaha, Utah, and Nevada, you know? Oh, I like that. And yeah. then, um, there's consequences that ripple for the general European campaign after that. Mm-hmm. What's some other ones? Oh, we oh. did the, Oh, the Gulf war one. How could I forget? Oh yeah. With, uh, with, uh, Oh my God. Uh, Schwarzkopf. Schwarzkopf. Yeah. General Schwarzkopf commits some act of impropriety during the Vietnam no, War. Is, you know, he, he basically gets, he, a mistake happens and he gets basically the blame gets put on him unfairly. Yeah, like a, yeah. an operation goes awry and it's not his fault, but like the brass like uses him as a scapegoat. And he ends up becoming like a mercenary and then he ends up becoming like the chief military advisor in Iraq. And it leads to a Gulf War where, uh, well, I'll spoil the ending. The, the Iraqis win. <laughs> <laughs> they defeat the Americans somehow. Um, and I, I think you mentioned like they get better thermal sites from the French. Yeah, yeah, some of the that. mistakes. But it, I mean, and again, it's not the most realistic, but it's funny. Like, you know, not, it just is like, how could this happen? And then, but then it results in John McCain becomes president uh, yeah. in the 1992 election. Oh, Michael Dukakis is president. And that's part of it because he has he to make some, revenge. Yeah. yeah. And then there's like a second Gulf War in the mid '90s, but everything goes right. It's just they talk about how uh, they they track down Schwarzkopf in his compound, and he's surrounded by the Fedayeen Saddam, and he's got a gold plated M60. <laughs> it's like ah, <laughs> you'll never take me alive. That was a fun. That was fun to write that one. That is, and then I stuck a ton of fake footnotes in that one in the Montgomery. Yes, one. fake footnotes are the best. Yeah, they're so good. Some goofy fake footnotes. Um, I love a goofy fake footnote. And then as kind of a writing exercise, we've kind of plugged in some of these ideas into chat gpt and they are terrible in, yes in they comparison. are like especially the ace stories you're like i did an immelman turn and i remembered my training and i took my spoon handled triggers and i fired like all this very try to keep it very stuff. realistic yeah. yeah whereas chat gpt is i shot down one japanese plane and then i shot down another japanese plane and then yeah. i shot down another one and then i shot down eight planes yeah it was yeah it's like <laughs> oh this is terrible yeah no the um the torch ones. I forgot about the aces ones. The Robert Conquest one. That may be yes. my favorite so far. The and That's the P the P forty seven versus ME two sixty two over Sicily in nineteen forty five. Oh, what was that? Tyrone Power. There was one with Tyrone yeah. Power. That was mm-hmm. the Panama Canal, right? No, that's uh, Acapulco. Acapulco. But they're still fighting Japanese, though. Right? Yeah, there's like yeah. a yeah boat planes or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like submarine launch boat planes, and <laughs> you know, I just found like old movie stars mm-hmm. or whoever just. Oh, uh, who's uh, who's the guy who was in uh, who would oh God uh, that guy who would do all those weird fencing movies uh, played Robin Hood uh, that movie star the guy who was like a terrible guy in real life Errol Flynn Errol Flynn I was gonna do one but then I changed it to that was the Yule Brenner. Oh, the the right. Mont, the the flying tigers one. That's right. Yeah, that Yule Brenner one is great. He's so full of himself and he <laughs> thinks he's so awesome. <laughs> I was going to do a Marlon Brando one too. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> similar, similar idea. Um, it's fun. It's yeah. off the wall. It's crazy. It's fun. I like it. Yeah. It's going to take time to get those into fighting shape, but yeah, to somehow put them together in some logical order and kind of keep them consistent. Yeah. Well, they somewhat lack logic at times, but that's the point. <laughs> that's it's kind of funny. the fun. It's yeah. kind of the fun of it. It, it. It's like, that's what's so funny about it is that it's got a slavish dedication to reality and then also sprinkled in there is like the most insane stuff ever. That it's just ridiculous. Mel Brooks fighting because I wrote it in like a very the Mel Brooks one's one of my favorites because he's flying a P sixty three King Cobra. It's in China, the end of the war. And he's like over Peking, and, and I try to do the air battle like in a very realistic form. Mm. But then you think back, wait, this is Mel Mel Brooks. <laughs> this is Mel Brooks doing this. <laughs> 
<laughs> and we we asked ChatGPT to do the uh, Mel Brooks story, and it was like, <laughs> it was like later in movies. <laughs> When I would be in my movies, I showed off my air prowess in those films, like History of the World Part One. Like, what yeah, are you talking well, about? Yeah, yeah, Young Frankenstein. I'll always think back to that time as the greatest adventure of my life, <laughs> as I blasted those guys out of the sky and killed them with my airplane. <laughs> like, yeah, what are you doing? Fun stuff. No, it uh, was a. It's been fun. Oh, there was an Al Jaffe one too. Yeah, rest in peace. Yeah. You uh you you try to write stories about very very old people. Yeah, one who are living people who are living. Yeah, I, and then several of the people who I wrote stories, and then subsequently they died because they were really old. Yeah, exactly. I when mean, you're 103 years old, it kind of yeah. It could be any. It could be any day. <laughs> I I always would joke to you about like, what if you sent this story to them? <laughs> it's ah. like, happy birthday! <laughs> I wrote a story about you, <laughs> and it's what. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is this? <laughs> Al, Al Jaffe is just like, <laughs> huh? <laughs> is this man threatening me or something? Like, what is this? <laughs> so wait, it's like I was in World War II, but I I wasn't a pilot and. <laughs> In, why was I trained in in Mexico or something? You know, whatever. You know, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, it's right. Yeah. The next thing I get is a restraining order. From... <laughs> Cease and desist at <laughs> once. Uh, no, no, no. It's all in good fun. This yes. is all clearly a joke. Yes, this is clearly... Ob- obviously yeah. so. Like the yeah. T. Oh, I forgot the another one. The T. E. Lawrence is American one too. I wrote it as a joke too. Yeah, he's like Lawrence of the Philippines or something like that. <laughs> I was joking that we need to write Lawrence of Bessarabia. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how that would work. We'll I, I'm work. not sure. We have to work on it. Yeah, but that would be a fun little. You know, like a story based entire. It's just like uh, when Turtle Dove wrote the Phantom to Bolkin. It's like I'm. That's a funny pun. I'm gonna write a story around this goofy. You know, because the Phantom Toll Booth, the Phantom to Bolkin. Yeah, I'll just come up with something. What do they have to do with each other? Nothing. Nothing. Writing something based on a joke. That's something that Turtle Dove does a lot. Like I, I'm sure I told you about this, but the uh, Guns of the South. The entire premise of that is based on a conversation he was having with a fellow author, and she was saying, like, I wrote this this book, and this cover they put on it was absurd. The only way it could have had less to do with the book is if they had Robert E. Lee with an AK-47 on the cover. And, like, Turtle Dove was like, hmm, that's an interesting idea. Or maybe I could do something with that. And then, you know, Guns of the South came out of that. Why does he sound like Buffalo Bill? <laughs> Watch a video of him. That's what he sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I was studying at uh, Berkeley, and uh, in order to not be drafted in the Vietnam War, I had to study something, so I chose Byzantine history, like that kind of thing. Like, that's what he sounds like. Huh. Interesting. Hmm. Huh. I'd love to interview him one day if, yeah. he, if he'd be willing. Yeah. If he would uh... tell about Guns of the South, the sequel where the North gets M16s. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, I mean, if he wanted to write a short story with that concept, that would be pretty funny. Not yeah. going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> well, good stuff. Well, this has been fun. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, while we were recording, I made an AI generated image of Jimmy Carter as an ace pilot in World War II. And I got to say, looks really good. Those are the best ones yet. Like, I'm shocked by how good this looks. Because <laughs> it looks like him and there's nothing wrong with his head or face. Yeah, his hands out of frame, frame. in every one of them. So that helps a lot. Not sure what's going on here. There's like a welding mask on while he's flying, but okay. <laughs> okay, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of potential with this. Yeah. Thing. yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about how like these AI generated images, they look like it was made by a person. And that's a little spooky because these days, artists, it takes so much time and effort to make this kind of stuff and to be kind of thrown a curveball and like, here's a program that can do the same thing you can do really quickly and easily and it kind of makes me feel bad and i almost want to try to like have us commission like weird alternate history images especially if we were ever going to collect these stories into some kind of compilation or whatever yeah or maps maps yeah oh my goodness i remember we were contacted by 
a gentleman at one point in the past. It might have been a woman. I, I don't. Anything's possible. The possibilities are endless. <laughs> but but someone uh, sent us that Panama Canal map where like the Japanese were fighting over it, and I was still I'm still over the moon about that. Like that was so dang cool. So like maybe we should try to contact that person again with one of these stories that we've written. Like, yeah. You know, do a campaign map from this time to this time. Yes, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah. That'd be fun. That'd be awesome. Uh, contact us on <laughs> talkingithistory at gmail.com, and we promise we'll try to read <laughs> We're so bad with the emails. It's horrific how bad we are, but we're going to be better. I promise. <laughs> this time I mean it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, a little spooky with the whole putting people out of jobs thing, but... You know, as we've stated a million times at the moment, people are way better, way, way better. Yeah. Yeah. So this was fun, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, uh, and and we'll come back with some more hot talking at history goodness. But before that, I, you know, Matt, we talk about AI, disruptive technology, the world's crazy, everything's changing, but there's one thing that hasn't changed for probably like a hundred years or so at this point, and that's throat discs. <laughs> throat disc is a classic, classic flavor, classic style. You know, you got all these herbs that you just don't see in a lot of other stuff. Kubeb, anise. Herbs, please, Max. Herbs, <laughs> yes. Uh, Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, you know, you just, you just get all this good stuff. Kubeb, uh, you know, and... Uh, it's it's a good throwback, a licorice. I mean, as I think children just don't understand licorice. They really don't. It it takes time. You grow older, and you just gr- gain an appreciation. It's a, it's a mature taste. Uh, I have an eighty eight year old grandfather, and I I give him throat discs all the time, and he's like, I love these. Like these are I can't get enough of them. Like he tells me, bring me more throat discs, please. Max. <laughs> I command you. <laughs> Next week, when we watch Bad Day at Black Rock, I want at least three bags of throat discs. He <laughs> tied me over. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I enjoy them. He enjoys them. Maybe you'll enjoy them, too. Just visit www.throatdiscs.com. That's D-I-S-C-S. And uh, check them out if you're interested. This is Matt signing off. And this is Max signing off. Have a good day, guys.